يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إني تارك فيكم الثقلين كتاب الله وعطرتي أهل بيتي ما إن تمسكتم بهما لن تضلوا بعدي وقد أنبأني اللطيف الخبير أنهما لن يفترقا حتى يردا علي الحوض صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله الله صلى الله عليه وآله Many people and some are the followers of Ahlul Bayt always have this a question in their mind. Why would we commemorate Ashura? What is the reason after 1400 years we are still in agony, anguish and tears? I have talked about that subject last year. But the better question, or the broader question, is that why do we treat our Imams, Ahlul Bayt alayhim as such in a way that we are treating them currently? By commemorating their martyrdoms, their birthdays, and many times those occasions are accompanied with anguish, grief, or sometimes in their birthdays with happiness. But so much stuck with them. As many people consider it to be very, in a very exaggeration. They say, you are exaggerating so much. My point today is to clear this, sense, this question to everybody. Why we follow Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam? Who are our Imams? At least, we know when we do these rituals and we commemorate their memory is for a good reason. You see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He scorns those people who follow blindly. Who whatever their forefathers, grandfathers used to do, they follow blindly without thinking, regardless of their faith, regardless whether good or bad. Bad. What they say, they say, Inna wajadna abaana ala ummatin wa inna ala atharihim muhtadun. We saw that our forefathers used to do certain things and we just followed them blindly. This argument is not acceptable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, if you want to choose a road, make sure that you know the reason behind it. Make sure that it is crystal clear to you. That's why my point tonight is to emphasize on this role. And inshallah, tomorrow night I will talk about this hadith that I recited at the beginning. Why we hold or revere our imams in a way that we are doing. What is the reason? Whether it is exaggerated or not. After your salawat. Allah. 
the hadith that I recited is narrated from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. To understand this hadith and the authenticity of hadith, I have to give you a, a little background, a brief introduction. And that is on the, on the classification of the hadith and narrations. There are many classifications. The scholars classify hadith based on certain criteria. One of them on the number of a quotation. How many times and by how many people or which ways that this exact hadith, either in articulation, specific articulations, or in meaning, has been repeated, has been narrated. They say there are three different types. One is the hadith that we call it mutawatir, recur recurring, repeating many times. This kind of hadith is repeated and narrated by different narrators that they never got together to forge this hadith meaning that there is no prior agreement among them to fabricate this hadith. You see one person comes from this door and tell you that there is a, fa there is a fire outside of the building. There another person comes from this door and repeat the same thing. A third one comes from the, th the, the back door. Fourth one comes from the front door. All of a sudden you see 20, 30 people at different times from different locations come to tell you that there is a fire outside. What is your conclusion? It is impossible that they sit to get together and corroborate and write a hadith from themselves. It has to be something. Otherwise, there is no chance for complicity. To this hadith, we call it mutawatir. There is other hadith. A hadith that is called a had or singular. A single hadith is a one hadith narrated by one individual. But the scholars say, look at this hadith and look at the individual who is narrating this hadith. Look at his circumstances. Is this person a trustworthy one? Has he ever lied about something? Check his background. Do a profiling study him. If it comes to be that he's a trustworthy, he never said the he he never said anything but the truth, and he was somebody who's devoted, meaning mu'min, then you will accept this hadith. A third kind of hadith that you really cannot trace the authenticity of this hadith, meaning that either the hadith does not say the reference. There is no bibliography. Who got it from who? And that person got it from who? Only says from Rasulullah. But who narrated it? There is no reference to this hadith. Or the person who narrates it has a question mark on it. Meaning that he is really not very trustworthy. He used to lie sometimes. To this hadith they call it da'if. Meaning it's a weak hadith, therefore the scholars reject it. What is the status of hadith al thaqalain the one that I recited to you? Here is the status. The ulama tell you that this hadith is from our side, meaning the Shia, the school of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, 89 narrators. From the Sunni side, 39 narrators. I will mention some of them. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, Abu Sa'id al-Khudari, Khuzaymat ibn Thabit, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Talha, Abu Huraira, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the father of Umar ibn Sa'd, right? Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, wa Umar ibn al-As. Those are some of the narrators that are acceptable at the Sunni school of thought. It is those who narrated this hadith. Now let's look at the leaders, the leaders of the sects, the scholars who have corroborated this in their books. And those are all from our Sunni brothers, not even a single one from our school of thought. And they are Muhammad ibn Ishaq, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Al-Imam Muslim, Ibn Majah, 
الترمذي النسائي أبو القاسم الطبراني شمس الدين الذهبي جلال الدين السيوطي المتقي الهندي محمد بن جرير الطبري الحاكم النيسابوري أبو نعيم الأصفهاني and keep going they are more than 500 people authors who at different times in different centuries have written this hadith this hadith you cannot find any hadith that have the same strength and same decisiveness all the groups from different sects have narrated this hadith this is from the authenticity it cannot be rejected at all by any notion the question what does it mean then the hadith rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in different occasions in four different occasions has narrated has said this hadith one in arafat hajjat al wida' which is the year of 11th of hijrah the other one at the doorstep of fatima al zahra alayhi salam the third time on Eid al Ghadir, Yawm al Ghadir, 18th of the Hajjah on the same year, Hajjat al Wida', and the last time when he was on bed on last minutes or last hours of his life, of his life, he repeated this hadith. Now the question, what does this hadith mean? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, I have left two precious things. One is Book of Allah. The other one is my Atrah, Ahlul Bayt. I will come and translate and explain what is Ahlul Bayt later. Those two things, they, if you stick with them, you grab them both together, you will not go astray. You will be successful. They will not be separated from each other until they come on me on Hawth, meaning on the day of Qiyamah. What does this mean? The ulama tell you that this is a very sharp notice exactly a very clear evidence of the infallibility of Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam that they are ma'sumin where do we get this one from two words two phrases of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. the first one he says wa innahuma lan yaftariqa the book of Allah and Utrah, Ahlul Bayt. Let's talk about Ahlul Bayt later, who they are. But for time being, we have a book and another entity called Ahlul Bayt. Rasulullah says that they are inseparable. They will not be separated. What is the notion of Quran? What is the status of Quran? What Muslim says about Quran? Does it have any falsehood? Does the Qur'an have any wrongdoing? Does it say anything that is not true? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ لَكِتَابٌ عَزِيزٌ لَا يَأْتِيهِ الْبَاطِلِ Falsehood will not approach Qur'an. لَا يَأْتِيهِ الْبَاطِلِ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَلَا مِنْ خَلْفِهِ تَنْزِيلٌ مِنْ حَكِيمٍ حَمِيدٌ This Qur'an, falsehood will not approach it. Not even a single letter. Everything is perfect. Everything is divine. Meaning that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has set an equation. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi. He's saying you don't want to be misguided. You want to be guided. Here is the formula. Take this equation. One side, on the right side, you have the Quran. Which is infallible the divine word of Allah. On the other side of equation, you have an entity called Ahlul Bayt, right? And they are inseparable. The question, if Quran is infallible, does not make any, any mistake, meaning one side of the equation is fixed, the other side of equation has to be fixed, right? Take algebra. Y equal x plus a three, right? If you play with this x, you move it up or down, Y also has to be moved up or down. But if you keep X, if you keep Y fixed, X cannot be moved, right? That's what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, that Quran is fixed, cannot take any mistake. The one that is attached to it and is never going to be separated, meaning the other side of the equation,
the other side of equation also will has, cannot change. Why? Because if it changes, Quran also have to change. So based on this phrase, وَإِنَّهُمَا لَنْ يَفْتَرِقَ Meaning that both are, are held at the same level in the same time together. And they will not be separated until they arrive on the Day of Judgment. This is one notion. The other one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, إِنَّهُمَا مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَن تَظِلُّوا بَعْدِي As long as you are with them, you grab them, you have hold of them, you will not be misguided. Right? You see, we have a principle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you love me, he tells his prophet, he tells him, tell those people, if you love me, meaning if you love Allah, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحُبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ If you love Allah, you follow me. What does that mean? It means that I am the only one who will take you straight to God. Right? Meaning that I will not be deviating. I'm not going to go astray. The road that will take you to God if you love Him. Meaning that eventually you want to get to Him. Therefore, if you want to get to Him, I am the one who will take you. Right? Meaning that, will I be doing any misguidance? Will I will misguide you and take you astray? Allah's road is only one. Therefore, if He tells His Prophet, that tell them, if they want me, if they love me, the divine entity of Allah, they have to follow you. Meaning that it is only the Prophet who will take them. Right? In the same notion. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, if you hold steadfast to the holy book and to the entity that is called Ahlul Bayt, right? You will not be misguided. Meaning that if Ahlul Bayt were fallible, meaning that they make a mistake, then we also be mis misguided, right? I cannot, I will not trust somebody that I don't know he will take me to the right direction or to the right, wrong direction unless I make sure that this person is taking me to the right direction, right? Therefore, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا Meaning that you follow them. When you, when, tamasuk meaning that you hold them very tightly. You don't let them loose. That's the point. Meaning every step they take, you better take after them. Whatever they do, you follow them. Whatever movement and gestures they have, also you do exactly the same. Now, if Ahlul Bayt had to make a mistake, then what's the point that Rasulullah would tell you and tell me and tell the entire people after him that follow those people who they may or may not be guided? Therefore, they have to be guided based on those two statements. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. The question, it is what is Asma? When we say infallibility, we need to define this word. What does it mean, Asma? Asma, the scholars say, the scholars say that in the reception of the message, and this case is for Rasulullah, in the reception of the revelation, the, the, the receiving of the revelation, and in maintaining and safeguarding the revelation, and in delivering the revelation, there should not be any wrongdoing, any mistake, any sin, any wrongdoing, any forgetfulness, whether deliberately or undeliberately. Meaning, whether he wants to or he doesn't want to, just by mistake. Asma, meaning in those three areas, receiving the message, Maintaining the message and delivering message, there should not be any single mistake, any single wrongdoing, whether wanted or non-wanted. That is called usma. This is in case of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, meaning in receiving the revelation. Our imams did not receive the revelation, but they received the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Therefore, 
in the reception of the teaching, in maintaining the teaching, and in delivering the teaching to people. Imams also have the same status as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, completely infallible, 100%. Al-Imam al-Sadiq, Al-Imam al-Baqir, Al-Imam al-Hadi, Al-Imam al-Jawad, and Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi. They have exact same infallibility. Of course, we believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is the best creature. None of the Imams reaches his status. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam has a very beautiful saying on that night that he was injured. Asbag ibn Nubata, one of his companions, came to him in a lengthy story. He told him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, are you better? Or Adam, he said, no, I am. And then he explains. Then he asks him, are you better or Nuh? He says, I am. He asks him about, about Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa and Isa. It's the same thing. Then he tells him, are you better or Rasulullah? He says, ya asbah, innama ana abdun min abidi Muhammad. I am a slave to Muhammad. Therefore, we, by saying the infallibility still, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is the best creature of all. That's unquestionable. But the question comes, this is on a religious basis. On intellectual basis, someone will come and tell you how possible that a human becomes infallible. How? We are a human. Again, we are part of the nature. God or Mother Nature have endowed us with certain features and characteristics. We have desires, we have conscious, and we have intellect. Now those are not perfect. Those, those humanitarian elements, those things that all humans share and have, those are spread among everybody, more or less. Sometimes in one is little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower. But the thing is that we all, as a humanity, we all share those elements. Then how possible? Some of us become fallible, make mistake based on those tools, and some of us are not. They are infallible. We should consider human. I mean, are our imams, or what they ask, is the prophet or that individual that you are talking about, is he human or not a human? If you say not a human, then that's another question. But if you say that he's a human, he's just like me and you, then he also is subjected to the same limit as our humanity, as us, are subjected to. You see one of the proverbials that we say that we are human, we make mistakes, right? Which is very accurate. So if the imam is also human, then how possible that he does not make a mistake, but I am the one who make a mistake? How would we answer this question? I talked a little bit about this one three days ago when I talked about the appraising, but I will rephrase it in a different words. You see, brothers and sisters, the infallibility, this notion, has to do with the personality of the person, right? With the personality, with our own characteristics. The scholars, the psychologists and sociologists tell you that there are three factors that will determine you. The first one is the environment. The second one is the upbringing, how you are brought up. And the third one is your own self, your own determination. I will talk briefly about each one of them. The first one, which is an environment. You are living in this place, right? In, let's say, in, in Southern California. Every night you come to the masjid, right? Now, how much you are exposed, for example, what are the chances? And this is, it has nothing to do with your faith. I'm just saying it as individuals, as a humans. How, what are the chances that all of us are exposed to gamble for gambling here in the masjid? or in this area? Very little. Why? Because at least there is no casino around us, right? We are in the masjid, even if we leave the masjid, around Irvine, luckily, is there any? Inshallah not. Okay. 
around Irvine and Orange County, there is no casino. Therefore, the chances of gambling is very minimal. But what about that guy who's working on a gas station across a casino in Las Vegas? How much he's prone to this? Well, let me rephrase it in another way. Assume somebody who does not know how to drive, and he once a while take a car. Somebody, either a friend or his family member, take him from one spot to another. How much this guy is exposed to a traffic accident, to that guy who participates in what is the, the, the car racing, the one that is, hold in, that is held in, is in, in NASCAR? In NASCAR. What is that? What are the chances that guy who takes the race of the cars is exposed to the, to the car accident with that guy who most of his time he's sitting at home and not doing anything? Well, there is a difference. The environment is a factor here. The environment tells you this guy who is in a very physical proximity with this danger or with this kind of thing, he has more exposure to that than that guy who's sitting backward. You are in the masjid, you're not exposed to a sin than that guy who's on the beach, for example, on Santa Monica, right? Even if he doesn't want to watch, even if he wants to close his eyes intentionally, right? your chances of not making the sand higher than him that he's in close proximity. So the environment is a playing factor. That's why you see that in the Islamic system tell you keep the environment in modesty. Make it a safe environment, a conservative environment. Why? So you don't have exposure to the sin. You don't have opportunity to the sin. When you don't have opportunity to the sin, inshallah, you will not commit the sin. So this is the first one. The second one is the upbringing. How father and mother raise the children, right? It is those who determine how much their children are exposed to things that they want them or to things that they don't want them. Assume someone who is very conservative. He doesn't allow his children, for example, to mix up with other children in the public school. He put them in a private school. He makes sure when they come back to, at home, he, they don't watch any cartoon, for example, any network or any program that is not suitable for, for, for him or for them, right? He always directs them to watch certain things. He chooses his, their friends. He chooses the families or, or the mother chooses the families that they go with them and interact with them. Okay? He always keeps eyes or she keeps eyes on the children. Whom they were talking with, whom they are associating with, what kind of food they are eating, how they are dressing and those kind of things. What are the chances that those kids are exposed again to the sin or to wrongdoing in general, to those kids who have indifferent parents, who tell you, hey Allah, so what? If they eat you know, in, the, in, in McDonald's, or in they went for the prom night, or if they ended up in the night club, so what? It's only one night per year. It's not a big deal. What are the chances? Of course, those family who protect their children, who keep their children, safeguard their children, will have less headache tomorrow. That's what I was telling you two, three nights ago, right? Compared to those people who always tell you, no, it's indifferent. Inshallah, when he grows up, he will start doing the prayers. Don't worry, okay? Those people will pay the price later. So the upper bringing also have a term. It has an obvious, it is an obvious factor in deciding the personality of the person. The last one is the determination, the will of the person, the resolve of the person, how strong you are in, a, in, in front of your desires, how capable you manage yourself. It is you, in case you do something, you right away become conscious and say istighfar and repent and come and ask a question, become a frequent member of the masjid. It is the will, 
the determination of people. You see, brothers and sisters, those two factors that I told you generally is the case. Sometimes you don't see it that way. For example, Nuh السلام, raised his family in the best way possible, right? He gave them the best environment. He showed them the true path. He told them, he advised them, but eventually one of his sons went astray. So was it the problem of Nuh? No, it was not the problem of Nuh. It was the personality of his son. It is the will of his son, the determination of his son. His son was not capable to determine for himself what is good, what is wrong. That's why he went ahead on, on a different mission, on a different path. So Asma, Asma involves those three factors. The environment, when you look at the Imams, where did they grow up? In which kind of environment they grew up? Next to the beach? Where did they grow up? In Medina. In Mecca. What were their families? Who was the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The noble family. Who was the family? What? Yesterday or before yesterday when I recited the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. When he said, if you wonder why I am not lying, if why I am not behaving, misbehaving because of this. And he says how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi raised him. So someone who was raised at the lap of Rasulullah, would you expect him to make any mistake? Of course not. And most importantly, the well. It is the well. It boils down to the well. It is the well who makes someone successful while the other one not successful. How would a medical student become a doctor? He has a will. He will cut off from his leisure time, from his parties, fix himself right on the textbook, on his studying and his studying 16 hours, 17 hours per day. He studies, he, he stayed, you know, stay up late night, does not deprive himself from sleep or from rest. Eventually, after so much struggle and hard work, he becomes a doctor. While other person, who may be as intelligent as that person, but he doesn't have the will, doesn't have the resolve. Therefore, he cannot become a doctor. The same thing, when you look into history, you see that there are certain individuals who made history by their own will. And there are certain individuals who were not capable to make a will. Look at Umar ibn Sa'd, the son of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. This man is the cousin of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When Ibn Ziyad ordered him to go and kill Imam, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he was hesitant. He has a beautiful poetry. Let me read it to you. He says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا أَدْرِي وَإِنِّي لَحَائِرٌ أُفَكِّرُ فِي أَمْرِي عَلَى خَطَرَيْنِ I don't know. I'm confused. I am torn between two things. أَأَتْرُكُمُ الْكَرَّيْ Ibn Ziyad told him, promised him, if you kill Hussein, Ray, rule, you know, Shahr Ray in Tehran, that you will be the governor of Ray. Governor of Ray, we will give it to you. Therefore, he says, I am dying about Ray. Or I come back with a disaster that I, call, that I killed my cousin Hussein. Hussein ibn Ammi, Wal Hawadithu Jummatun, La Amri. I, you know, it will be the joy of my eyes. How should I leave Mulk al -ray? Then he makes his decision. What? He says, They say, they claim that Allah has created hell and heaven and punishment and reward. Then, if they are truthful, if what they are saying is correct, فَإِنْ صَدَقُوا فِي مَا يَقُولُونَ أَنَّنِي أتوب للرحمن من سنتين. Two years before I die, I make استغفار إن شاء الله, and everything will go nicely, smoothly. وإن كذبوا, and if they were not telling the truth, if they were lying, وإن كذبوا فزنا بدنيا عظيمة وملك عقيم دائم الحجلين. If they were not telling the truth, then I'm victorious. Let's kill Hussein and go. Eventually, it was Umar ibn Sa'd who made his decision. And the same, right on the contrary, on, this, on the opposite side, Hurr ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. This man was hero of Kufa. 
He was an army leader of Ibn Ziyad, the army of Bani Umayyah. On that day of Ashura, he was trembling. He was shaking. So one of his friends told him, Al-Muhajir ibn Aws, told him, what's wrong with you, Ya Hur? If anybody would tell me who's the hero of Kufa, I would not forget your name. I would, see it is, I would say it is you. What was his word? He says, Wallah inni la ara nafsi mukhayyaratan bayn al jannati wal nar. I am between two things, between heaven and hell. I will not take anything over heaven. And that's why he drove toward Imam Hussein. Eventually, it was his own will, his own determination. Hajr ibn Adi, Hajr ibn Adi, one of the companions of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. This man was taken by the forces of Muawiyah. They expelled him from Kufa toward Muawiyah. Muawiyah heard that they brought Hajr. They told, they told the people, keep him there. Then ask him to renounce Ali ibn Abi Talib. To renounce him. To curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. The man refused. You see, there is a beautiful saying about Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha. Aisha, the wife of Rasulullah, said, if Muawiyah did not have any sin except for the killing of Hijr ibn Adi, then he will be at the bottom of the hell. That is the wordings of, Ma of, of Aisha. When they brought him, they told him, renounce Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, La wallah, I will not. They told him, we will execute you. He said, that's fine, execute me. He, along with his son. So they were about to kill him. He said, kill my son first. They said, why would we kill your son first? He said, I am afraid this young man, if he see that you will kill me, he will be afraid. He will be scared. I am afraid that he, God forbid, will renounce Ali ibn Abi Talib. Therefore, I want to make sure that he stays on the right path. Kill him in front of me and then come and kill me. They killed the son and then they killed the father. The beauty, the irony, today if you go to Mu'ta, to, to, I'm sorry, in a place in Syria, where, where, he, where he has been in Merja Adra, the place that he's been buried in Merja Adra. You see on the stone, it says, هَذَا قَبْرُ سَيِّدُنَا حِجْرَ الَّذِي قَتَلَهُ سَيِّدُنَا مُعَاوِيَةِ Which one to believe? It is Sayyiduna Hajr or Sayyiduna Muawiyah. Isn't that funny? Isn't really that funny or ridiculous? I mean, which one? If you tell me either this one or that one. Cannot be both our masters of heaven? Impossible. Anyway, another one, Qambar. Qambar was a slave of Ali ibn Abi Talib, a servant of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This man was taken by Hajjaj. The same thing. Hajjaj tells him, renounce Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I will not. If you show me a better religion, better faith than Ali ibn Abi Talib, I will accept it. Show it to me. He said, if you don't, I will execute you. He said, execute me. He said, you know, you will be executed. But choose which way you want to be ex executed. He said, the choice is yours, not mine. Because in the same way that you will execute me, Allah will execute you tomorrow. So it is your own choice. You decide. And he executes him. So again, it boils down to the determination. When we say asma, infallibility, we say that it is the real determination of the person. Now, for us, every you know, you see, there is there is something that every action we do, there is a consequence for it, right? Whether good or bad. It has to have a consequence. The problem with us, ordinary people, we do not see the consequences. When we commit a sin, we're oblivious about the consequence. The ma'asum, alayhi salam, he sees the consequences. He knows what it would be, what is the result, how he will end up. Therefore, he abstains. Imagine if you have a cup of water. I said this yesterday. If you have a cup of water or a cup of orange juice. You know that in this orange juice, there is poison. Would you drink it? Why? Because you know the consequences. You know immediately what will happen to you. The same thing with the ma'asun. Therefore, when he does not commit a mistake, he see it. He noticed it. That's why Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Wallahi law kushif li al yaqina. I will see behind the scenes. Therefore, nothing will happen to me. I will see my action. I will see the result of my action. Therefore, they do not commit any mistake. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.
the last thing that we will talk about tonight, inshallah, we will carry this topic tomorrow. The last thing, inshallah, it is who are Ahlul Bayt? Who are they? You need to define Ahlul Bayt. You tell the people, based on this hadith, you say, okay, I will give you a direct reference from the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran tell me who are Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam They tell you, okay, where it is. You tell them, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Innama yuridu Allah liyudhib ankum ar-rich ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, this is, this, is, this is the ayah. What they will tell you, they tell you beautiful. Is that what you meant by Ahl al-Bayt? By reciting this ayah? But recite the ayah before it. Recite the sentence before that and recite the sentence after that. Then it will be clear that it is not those Ahl al-Bayt. Ahl al-Bayt is someone else. Not those Imams that you claim that they are. And read the ayah. The ayah before that, it says, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى وَأَقِمْنَ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتِينَ الزَّكَاةِ وَأَطِعْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And then the ayah comes. It is talking in a female pronunciation or pronoun for the females. If you trace this ayah, the ayah before it starts with this, يَا نِسَاءَ النَّبِي it is talking about the wives of Rasulullah. It's not talking about the Imams. What you're seeing, this is a con. You, you can't take it out of context. The context show you that it is the wives of Rasulullah. If you don't believe me, look at another reference for Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he calls Ibrahim and his wife, he says, Rahmatullahi alaykum Ahlul Bayt. Okay? May the blessings of Allah will take you, which include Ibrahim and his wife. So the word Ahl, family, is referred to the wives. If you don't believe us, another one, Musa alayhi salam, in the Holy Quran, again, narrates that Musa tells his family when he goes back to Egypt after he gets married, he says, Wasara bi ahlihi. Then the ayah, if I have. Well, anyway, it says, Sara bi ahli qala inni anastu nara. He told his family, and again the word ahlihi, the Quran used the word ahlihi, that it is his family, it is the wife and the children. How would we answer this? We tell them, fine. Read the ayah. Innama yuridu Allah liyudhiba ankum ritsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tathira. What does it mean? What is Allah trying to say here? What is the objective? What is the implications? What is he is going to say? Does this mean, meaning that purifying from any rids. Rids could be any sin or any misguidance or any mistake. So this ayah, here is the question. Does this ayah imply infallibility or does not imply infallibility? Which one? So let's choose the first one. Why? Because Ahmad ibn Taymiyyah says this is referred to the wives of Rasulullah, not to the Ahlul Bayt, not to the Imams. And it does not mean infallibility. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is vindicating those wives of Rasulullah from marital infidelity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah stressing, telling the entire world, the entire world, that the wives of Rasulullah do not cheat. That's what it is. It's vindicating them. To me, and to the millions of Muslims, this is more of an insult than a praise. You would expect a normal woman, let it be a Muslim or not Muslim, a normal woman who has a, wife, who has a husband, to have fidelity, right? Any person, any person, not ha it doesn't have to be a Muslim, non-Muslim, agnostic, tell him somebody, some woman got married with someone. Do you think that she will cheat? He says no. Why? Because they have in this spiritual bond. Therefore, any woman 
is not supposed to do this one, let alone the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You tell, for example, you tell your mother, you tell someone that you respect, you tell her mother, mashallah, you're such a wonderful lady because you do not fornicate. Which kind of a praise is this? You tell your father, you're mashallah, such a wonderful father. You do not commit adultery. Or you do not drink alcohol. We'll tell you, you drink alcohol. Why would I drink alcohol? This is more of an insult than a praise to, to, to the wives of Rasulullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not come to say this to the wives of Rasulullah that you're such a wonderful ladies because you do not commit adultery. This is worse. So the question, if this one means usma, fallibility. I tell you brothers and sisters, except all the Islamic sects, look at all Islamic sects, only the followers of Ahlul Bayt who attribute usma, infallibility to their leaders. They do not even, our brothers, our Sunni brothers, they do not even attribute infallibility to the Rasulullah himself. They don't even consider Rasulullah to be infallible, let alone the rest, let alone the wives of Rasulullah. Based on their ahadith, I'm not bringing from my pocket. Look at the ahadith. They say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in different occasions have made a mistake. Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma. This is the ayah. Look at all narrations. All the mufassirin, they tell you this was Rasulullah. Rasulullah one day was sitting, a blind man, a poor man came to him. Rasulullah frowned, got upset and turned his back. What is this? Isn't that a mistake? Many times, sometimes Rasul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala castigate his messenger. So some, Why did you permit those mukhalifin to leave the, the town? So it's full of castigation. Based on them, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi himself is not infallible, let alone his wives or other people. But let's just assume for the sake of argument that they also consider the infallibility. To whom? To the wives of Rasulullah. How many wives Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had? You see the ayah is general. He says ahl, ahlul bayt, meaning the entire wives. There were nine wives. Right? He does not, the ayah does not single any wife of Rasulullah. Keep them all in one chunk. Says you, Ahlul Bayt, you are infallible. And those are nine of them. So it is basically the category of the woman of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Right? So, if someone come to prove that one of them, one of those wives have made a mistake, has committed a sin, that category will be invalidated, right? Because the ayah does not specify which wife of Rasulullah to be infallible. Rather, he uses them as a whole sum. All of you, the wives of Rasulullah, are infallible. Therefore, if someone finds one of them to have a mistake, then the ayah does not mean the wives of Rasulullah because they are invalidated. It has to be for other categories of people that the ayah talks about. What is that notion? The ayah, luckily, the sentence before this ayah, the Quran says, وَقَرْنَ بِهِ بُيُوتِكُنْ Oh, the wives of Rasulullah, sit down in your homes. A specific command, not to any other person, but to the wives of Rasulullah. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ Sit down. When? At what time? It is not during the time of Rasulullah. Why? Because Rasulullah would know at what time they leave, what time they come. It is telling them after Rasulullah. After Rasulullah, be careful. Stay at home. There is a hadith. One day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is sitting amongst all, among all nine wives. He tells them this. He says, لَيْتَ شِعْرِي أَيَّتُكُنَّ صَاحِبَةُ الْجَمَلِ الْأَدَبِ which one of you will be riding over that tall and fat camel? Who's that person? That one will get to the point, to a village called Hawab. There will be dogs that will be barking. تَنْبَحُهَا كِلَابُ الْحَوْأَبْ يُقْتَلُ عَنْ يَسَارِهَا 
وَمَيَمِينُهَا خَلْقٌ كَثِيرٌ Many people on her left side and her right side, many people will be killed. Many people will, keep, will be killed. This is narrated, let me tell you who narrates this one. Ibn Kathir in his history, Asyuti in his book, Khasa'is, and Ibn, Abd, Ibn, Abdil, Ibn Abdil Bar fil Isti'ab. Those are three people. There are Ibn Hanyat al Awliya also writes, and Khatib al Baghdadi narrates this one, but just for the sake of simplicity. Three people narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi told his wives, Do not leave your home. One of them left her home. She went, fought with the Imam of her time, right? Some say that she repented. Fair enough. We accept her repentance, inshallah. But at that time, at that specific time, did she make a mistake or not? Did she commit a sin or not? If she commit a sin, meaning that this ayah is not valid for them. It is talking about completely different categories of those people. Who are those? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, one of the wives of Rasulullah, Ummu Salama, Ummu Salama says, I was sitting at home. Rasulullah was in my home. All of a sudden, Fatima arrives. Afterward, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and Ali ibn Abi Talib, Rasulullah grabs them all under one ceiling, under one cover. At that time, this ayah arrives. إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا آيت اللهم صل على محمد I told ya Rasulullah can I enter he said no am I allowed to get in he said no ya ya أم سلمة the wife of Rasulullah he said أنت على خير you're fine but you cannot enter who are the أهل البيت None of the Sahaba has doubted even a single, a single time, not even one percent, who are Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt are not the wives. Abu Sa'id al Khudri and Zayd ibn Arqam says it cannot be the wife, Ahl, Ahl family. A wife in the morning she's considered wife, in the afternoon she can be completely a stranger person. With a divorce, one word she can be divorced. She cannot be part of. The family, a family member is the one who, at, who, who will take the trait of the person, who will get the blood of the person, who get the flesh of the person. That is the person called family. That is the person who is called Ahl. Umm al fadl said, on the day that Imam Hussein was born, I, was, I saw a very horrible dream. I saw a part of a flesh of Ramzul Sulullah fall, fall on, my, on, on my lap. I was scared. I went to Rasulullah, told him, Ya Rasulullah, I noticed this dream, this, this, this horrible dream. He said, don't be so afraid. My, my, Fatima, my, my daughter soon, Fatima, will deliver a baby, a beautiful baby. His son is Hussein, and he will fall in your lap. You will take care of him. She said that I was the first one who held that baby. I brought that baby to Rasulullah. When I brought him, he looked at him. He kissed him. He hugged him. Then I saw the tears coming from his eyes. I told him, what's wrong, Ya Rasulullah? Is there something wrong with this baby? He said, no. No, Ya Umm Al-Fadl. I'm crying for what my nation will do to this baby. That's what has happened. A man... A man, today we are talking about Ali al-Akbar, a Christian man during the time of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. He dreamed, in, in the dream, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi comes and invites him to Islam. He gets up in the early morning. He asks, where is this prophet? They told him this prophet died 30 years ago. He's gone. He asked, does he have any progeny? Any family member? They told him, yes, Imam Hussein, go visit him. He goes and knocks on the door. He knocks on the door and goes inside. He tells Imam Hussein, Ibn Rasulullah, are you the son of Rasulullah? He said, yes, I am the grandson of Rasulullah. He told him, I have dreamed that Rasulullah came to me and invited me to Islam. But you know, I would like to see that man, Rasulullah. You know, if I see him, I will immediately become Muslim. He said, if you see him, will you recognize him? He said, yes. Imam Hussein told him, what about if I bring you someone similar to him? Similar to Imam, to, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He said, go, ya Rasulullah, please. Imam Hussein goes inside. 
and he brings a young man, 27 years old man. He told him, Ya Hada, have you seen this man? The man, when he looked at that person, that young man, he was shocked. He started to cry. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this is the man that I saw in my dreams. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, he declares his Islam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Imam Hussein asked him, one question, he told him, Ya Hada, if you had a son like this son, what would you to, to do to him? He, would, he said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I will keep him like a chandelier. I would not leave him. I would not allow him to leave the home, keep, keep eye on him 24 hours. He said, Ya Hada, what about, if, what, what about if a tiny spike goes in the leg of this man? What would you do? He said, I will die, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. I will collapse. He told him, you know what will happen to me? I will see the sun decapitated chopped into pieces in front of my eyes yeah, the man collapses and falls unconscious on that day on day of Muharram everybody, all narrator says whoever came to, um, to, to Imam Hussein alayhi salam to say farewell, to go to the battle Imam Hussein would tell him don't you want to think one more time He's hesitant to give them the permission, except his son. When his son came to him and told him, I am going to the battlefield, Imam Hussein held him, started to weep and cry, and he said, Ubruz barakallahu feek. Go toward the battlefield. Go toward the enemy. The man goes, the young man goes and fight. Ali al-Akbar fights. At that time, Layla, the mother of Ali al-Akbar, in the tent, looking at the gestures at the face of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein is looking at his son as he is fighting. When Imam Hussein, his face would get terrified, this man, this woman would get terrified as well. She would ask Imam Hussein, Ya Aba Abdullah, how is my son? Imam Hussein told her, go and pray, because I have heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that the prayer of mother and her son, Allah will accept. I'm afraid.